On October 20th, 1947, a congressional committee began hearings on un-American activities in the movie industry. People with unpopular political opinions were accused of subversion and lost their jobs. They were blacklisted. From Hollywood, the blacklist spread to businesses and universities, institutions and communities across the country. Thousands became the targets of denunciations, suspicion, and fear. This is the story of one man and his family and their life under the blacklist for 15 years. Blacklisted, episode six, reprieved. O oh God, exalted and full of compassion, grant perfect peace to the soul of Isidore Brody, who has gone to his eternal home. Master of mercy, we beseech you. In the fall of 1960, when I was a junior in high school, my grandfather died of a stroke. He'd been a man of great strength and character. But by the end of his long illness, he could scarcely tell up from down or an enemy from a friend. One afternoon, as I leaned over his bed to say hello, he mistook me for a Cossack who had tried to kill him in a pogrom 60 years before. No one tried harder to comfort grandfather as he fell apart than his son-in-law, my father Gordon. When my father had brought us from Mexico to New England five years before, grandfather had taken us in, in spite of all the warnings he got that he was giving aid and comfort to a communist. Gordon Kahn, Security Matters C. A confidential source says Khan was present at the burial of his father-in-law, Isidore Brody, and continues to be employed as a freelance writer under different pseudonyms at 200 Prospect Street, Manchester, New Hampshire. A spot surveillance of that address reveals the car's license plate is LK881. J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, had had my father under surveillance all my life. If Khan has recently been active in the Communist Party or Communist Party fronts, you must make certain your investigation is the type of investigation which will bring it to light. By the fall of 1960, Hoover needed something incriminating at once. Without proof of subversive activities in the last five years, Hoover would be forced to drop my father from the security index, the list of people he kept who could be imprisoned without trial in a national emergency. Confidential. An informant who sees Khan on a social basis is of the opinion he is involved in the settlement of his father-in-law's estate, a man of considerable means. As usual, much of Hoover's information was incorrect. Grandfather wasn't rich and neither were we. Mother would be up at four the next morning to catch a ride to her teaching job in a small New Hampshire town 15 miles away at the only high school that would hire her as the wife of Gordon Kahn. And my father would be back in his little office at the rear of the house, writing the short fiction and funny magazine articles he was selling under the name of Hugh G. Foster. And once he'd finished with that, he'd be back in his used car on the road to New York to research new articles and ideas, making sure to call ahead first to save money by staying with a relative or friend. Hello, sweetheart. It's your Uncle Gordon, the threat to the United States. <laughs> Is your father in? He was nearly 60 now, and I was worried about how exhausted he looked. Lately, I'd been coming home from school to find him asleep on the living room couch, still wearing the beautiful old sports jacket he loved to work in, or the monocle he'd worn since he was a young man, and that made him look a lot more like a baron than a Bolshevik. As far back as I could remember, someone or other had been after him to confess he was or had been a communist, and to give them the names of others to investigate. He'd always refused. He wouldn't even tell me if he'd belonged to the party. In 1948, when I was three, in the same time it now took him to write an article, he'd written an entire book called Hollywood on Trial, attacking the House and American Activities Committee 
and its attempt to investigate people in the movie business on the basis of what they believed. But there was nothing in that book about what had happened to us after the hearings were over, or the 13 years he had spent under a blacklist, unable to support his family or sell a single sentence under his real name. The few times I tried to get him to tell me how he felt, he changed the subject. And I hadn't pushed. The last thing he needed, I figured, was one more investigation from his son. with this collection of Judases who sit there in violation of the United States Constitution. But in the fall of 1960, the House and American Activities Committee was coming back. It had opened new hearings into communist influences in the labor unions of San Francisco. Hundreds of protesters, many of them college students, had been washed down the steps at the San Francisco courthouse with fire hoses and dragged to jail. The committee had released a movie called Operation Abolition, claiming the protests were a communist conspiracy. The students are, as I pointed out to them in San Francisco, toying with treason. They have been handpicked by the communists to do the dirty work of the communists. The Manchester Union leader, the local newspaper, had been arranging free screenings, one of them at my high school the following week. In all the years we'd been on the run for what my father believed, my biggest secret had been that aside from loyalty to my family, I had no politics. Now I was afraid to tell my father I didn't know what to do. If I objected publicly to the movie, would we be in trouble again? If I didn't, would I be letting him down? And I'd sit there wondering what he wanted from his son. The morning of the assembly, I put on a white shirt and tie, and without telling anyone at home, went to the principal's office with two other classmates and asked him not to show Operation Abolition. He refused us, and I thought the issue was closed. Half an hour later at the screening, the principal announced that three Central High School students had come into his office that morning and tried to deny their classmates the right to hear the truth about the communist menace. That evening, the Manchester Union leader claimed there might be communists at Central High. William Loeb, the editor of the newspaper, hadn't printed our names yet, but everyone from the governor on down knew who we were. One of the first calls came from the local Jewish community center, where Mother taught Jewish history. God's name does your son think he's doing? Loeb is an anti-Semite. We don't want trouble. Mother had never been active politically herself. Her main concern since we'd arrived in Manchester, besides finding a job, had been to push my brother Jim and me to do our best in school and get a scholarship out of town. Jim had earned a full scholarship to Harvard two years before. Now it was my turn. She'd never say so. But I had a feeling that in less than two minutes in the principal's office, I had done more to hurt her than if I had dropped a bomb. Damn. Maybe grandfather was right. Maybe I was a Cossack. Two days later, my Temple Youth Group called an emergency meeting. Over 20 people showed up. Some of them wanted us to send a letter to the newspaper reassuring it we weren't communists. Some said it was time for Jewish businesses to stand up to the Red Scare and take their advertising out of the newspaper. The meeting broke up with nothing decided. My father, who hadn't said much, turned to me outside by his car. I think the newspaper's gonna leave you alone, he said. <laughs> a lot of people in there were against me, I said. I noticed, he replied, but things are changing. Not one of them was afraid to be seen with me. My father was right. The Operation Abolition story melted away. After 15 years of suspicion, surveillance, and fear, the Cold War was beginning to thaw. <laughs> 
If you are happy now in the United States and in the world around us, Mr. Nixon's your man. In Washington that summer, John Kennedy, the Democratic candidate for president, suggested that if elected, he would repeal Truman's executive loyalty order, which had driven over 8,000 suspected leftist government workers from their jobs. In Hollywood, producer Otto Preminger announced that Dalton Trumbo had written the screenplay for his latest film, Exodus, and would get screen credit for it. Time Magazine said it was the official end of the blacklist. A few weeks later, Holiday Magazine, which had known for years who my father was, asked him to start using his real name. It's time for the recovery of my name, as of now. I don't owe anything to anybody but money. But his next article on Jewish restaurants appeared under the name of Hugh G. Foster. And the next. And the next. Maybe the habits of 14 years of concealment were just too hard to break. I just don't see how we can afford a better car, Gordon. There are big expenses coming up for the boys. Where do you think the money is going to come from? I feel it's my responsibility to keep on top of these things. That year, Hugh G. Foster would clear $4,000, barely enough to pay for his heart medications and car repairs, but $4,000 more than Gordon Kahn had made in 14 years. A spot surveillance at the suspect's home address confirms that his automobile still carries New Hampshire license plate LK881. And maybe it was superstition. For 15 years, J. Edgar Hoover had hounded Gordon Kahn into professional silence, but he'd left Hugh G. Foster alone. Would Hoover make one last attempt to destroy my father for daring to declare who he really was? And so, Gordon Kahn picked up where the committee had left off and blacklisted himself. My father couldn't know it, but Hoover had already let him go. Bureau reports on the captioned individual fail to reflect that his activities fall within the criteria for the security index. It is the department's decision that the name of Gordon Kahn should be removed. Where did you put the keys to the car? Where you left them. Listen, if you can't be responsible... Listen, if you can't remember... That fall and winter, my father and I argued constantly. You act as if I can't do anything right without your being around. Even when I am, I have my doubts. One minute he would insist I handle more responsibilities. The next he wouldn't trust me with his car. I got accepted at Harvard, and the closer the time came for me to leave home, the more he treated me like a child. I wanted him to let me get closer. I wanted to get away. For a son of 17 and a father of 60, who had never spoken heart to heart, it was a difficult goodbye. You, you think I can't handle money or a single responsibility? Well, who the hell do you think I am? You? <sighs> He'd started smoking again. Dear Gordon, a letter from Dr. Crane has arrived from the vascular clinic at the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital. While lying on his pillow one night, my father had heard the blood pounding in his head. His doctor told him it was a symptom of hardening of the carotid arteries to the brain. Like grandfather, he might have a stroke at any time. He told no one, and as usual, tried to keep it light. Dear Sam, whether you hunger for it or not, the big news here is that I may have survived another New England winter by sixth. Recently, my father had gotten back in touch with his oldest friend from Hollywood, a man with whom he had split politically at the start of the blacklist nearly 15 years before. It was no small sign of the times that they had shaken hands. Holiday Magazine still keeps me employed to the limit of my capacity. About six articles a year is all I care to do, since that amply covers my needs. My wants are another thing. But I'd be hard put to say what really I would want that I don't have. I don't mean to sound smug, simply that contentment is just about all I ever bargained for, even at times when things beyond that were attainable. Surely you'll be in New York again before I get to California, if ever I do. Swear that you will send up a flare so that I can get you to have a Dixie cup of warm gin with me before, as you always seem to be doing, you hurry away. As always, 
Gordon. My first semester at Harvard, my father got an assignment from Holiday to do a profile of his old friend, the actor Zero Mostel. Mostel was a huge success by then, a comic genius, some said, bigger than life. A piece about him should have been an easy job for Foster, but it wasn't. November 16, 1962. Struggled all day on Zero Mostel. Three miserable pages. December 5, trying to get the bloody revision finished. But how? It turns out that in telling Zero's life story, my father had left out a crucial period. For 15 years, Zero had been blacklisted too. If Gordon Kahn was going to write about Zero's character, he was going to have to write about what had also happened to Gordon Kahn. He did. During the roughshod crusades in the McCarthy years, Patrioteering bully boys everywhere began compounding blacklists of artists, directors, and writers. For the first time in 15 years, he wrote publicly about the blacklist. The list was circulated where they would do the most good in the television and motion picture industry. And what it took to push its stifling weight off your confidence and character day after day. Alternating congressional subcommittees dangled professional life or death before hundreds of talented performing artists, directors, and writers. When they had labbed the names of fresh victims, they were turned over to a group of industry talkware mothers for further scourging before they could assume a job. The honor of the American people. Those whose names were listed under subversive didn't get another day's work for years. Some, not yet. Now we, we don't do the same thing to you. December 15, 1962. Closed deal for the rover and took possession. Beautiful. That Christmas, he traded in his old car for a used Rover 100 sedan with a walnut dash and red leather seats. He reassured Mother he could pay for it out of his next two articles for holiday. Finally, he had a gorgeous car that worked. To celebrate, he mapped out a grand tour for the holidays. First to drive to New York with Mother and Jim to meet me at his old friend Al Hirschfeld's where I'd been visiting with his daughter, Nina then to Baltimore for Jim's medical school interview, then to a special lunch holiday magazine was throwing for him in Philadelphia, and finally a stop in Washington to see an old friend and editor. Not long after, I found the travel map the AAA had sent him, tracing the best route. His last stop was to be the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., where the House and American Activities Committee hearings and the blacklist had begun 15 years before. I think the purpose of the trip was murder. I think he was going to kill Hugh G. Foster. I think that to his friends in New York and Philadelphia, he was planning to announce that Gordon Kahn was back and that for him at last, the blacklist was over. The night before he left, he went to dinner at a friend's house with mother and Jim and the weather worsened quickly. His friends begged them to stay overnight. Good. Stay inside. Good. But he was determined to start his car. And get his family home. At four o'clock the following morning, I got a call in New York from Jim, telling me my father was dead. He had tried to start his new car in the worst winter storm in 70 years and suffered his final heart attack, refusing to give up or come in from the cold. Gordon was a great many things to me, to us. He was principal put into practice. He was a blithe spirit with a precious sense of humor. <laughs> 
Condolence cards came from Madrid, London, Rome, Paris, Mexico City, Barcelona, Los Angeles, and New York. It was the diaspora of the blacklisted, the writers, directors, actors, and producers of Hollywood's fading golden age, who, like my father, had chosen exile or unemployment to naming names. They remembered him as a colleague, a loyal friend, and most of all, a writer. A writer's writer. His office was just as he'd left it, ready for another day's work. As long as I could remember, the sound of his typing had filled the house, letting me know he was near, sizing things up with style. His friends had told me that as the ambulance took him to the hospital, he'd managed one last quip to cheer them up. Like General MacArthur, he'd raised his hand and whispered, I shall return. It was hard to believe he wouldn't. A confidential informant at City Hall advised that Gordon Kahn died in the city of Manchester. This case is being placed at a closed status as name is being deleted from Class A of Reserve Index. Derogatory information on other individuals listed herein is currently being submitted by this office in separate individual reports and surveillance on them should be maintained. A few days later, Holiday wrote to say that my father's article on Zero Mostel would run under his own name. Soon after, the Reader's Digest asked if they could excerpt one of his pieces. They referred to him as Gordon Kahn. So did Playboy, who called to say they'd be including one of his stories in an anthology of fiction on Hollywood. He'd gotten back his name after all. It would have amused him, especially the news we got next. An old friend in Europe, John Collier, a writer of tales of the supernatural and the bizarre, wrote to say that a ticket he had bought a few months before in my father's name had just won $2,000 in the Irish sweepstakes on a hundred-to-one long shot called Reprieve. That summer, Jim and I went to pick up the prize money in Dublin. Reprieved had paid enough to finance our first trip to Europe. I'd been thinking about a conversation I'd had with Mother before we left. I never trusted that any time was safe, really, Tony. Only when he died. That's an awful thing, but it's true. I never knew what was going to happen when someone might come to the door or accuse him of something because someone had said something or seen his name attached to something. And I got very angry at myself for feeling that way. It's horrible. I'm angry to think that such a thing can exist. And yet, how he really felt, I never knew. Gordon was always such a silent man. Not long before, Mother had found a note on his desk. It said, I stand before the tribunal of my own mind. It helped explain what it must have been like for him behind that office door on the bad days when he'd wondered if he'd ever be a breadwinner again, or how quickly he could have bought back what he'd lost in income and importance if he just told the committee what it wanted to hear. Jim and I were crossing into Hungary where my father was born. He'd left when he was six and never come back. In fact, this so-called un-American had never willingly left the United States. During the five years we'd spent in exile in Mexico, he'd written a novel called A Long Way From Home, about another exile from the States, a 17-year-old like myself named Gilberto. The book could have been full of bitterness about the United States. It was full of hope. The United States of the North, Don Solomon said, makes no mistakes from which it cannot survive. Even at its worst, Gilberto, America corrects its errors and goes into another rewrite. All his life, my father had written and rewritten his version of America. He had covered some of its biggest stories as a reporter. He had helped shape its popular culture as a screenwriter. And he had fought in one of its great struggles to define what it meant to be a good American. He'd even come face to face with J. Edgar Hoover. One night in October 1947, 
at dinner with some of the other unfriendly witnesses who had been subpoenaed by the House and American Activities Committee, my father had gotten up from his table at Harvey's restaurant and walked to the men's room. Down the stairs, arm in arm with his male lover, perfumed and in lipstick, came J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover and my father recognized each other and passed without a word. <laughs> My father was hardly the only person in Washington to know that one of America's biggest champions of traditional morality was also one of its biggest hypocrites. But he was one of the few who had nothing to lose by making the information public. He never did. The only record of what my father had seen that night was in a confidential report from one of the men at my father's table, who turned out to be an informer. It stayed in my father's FBI file where Hoover could look at it for the nearly two decades he spent collecting information to ruin my father's reputation and career. Dear Mr. Hoover, I realize communist tactics are to discredit individuals regarded as their enemies and desire to make this known to the director in the first place to indicate my willingness to be of assistance whenever possible. My father was one of the lucky ones in that unlucky time. He never betrayed a principal or a friend. You might call it character, but she didn't know if you had it till your turn came. I figured we'd all have the chance to find out. The fear the country lived through during the blacklist was easy to cook up. All it took was the threat of losing your income and your name. I was tired when we arrived that morning in Budapest and I sat on a bench by the station. I'd nearly drifted off when I noticed a little boy holding what looked like his baby brother by the hand. For a second, I thought I was seeing Jim and me the day we arrived in exile in Mexico, or 50 years before us, my father and his little brother Ben, the day they landed in America. I wondered what paths these little travelers would follow. I hoped for them, what my father had done his best to offer me, an honest life, with people to love beside you, and something decent to believe in when you stand alone. And I sat there wishing the children well, till I lost them in the crowd. Blacklisted Episode 6, Reprieved, was performed by Ron Liebman as Gordon Kahn, Stockard Channing as Barbara Kahn, Carol O'Connor as J. Edgar Hoover, and Tony Kahn as the narrator. The cast also featured Julie Harris, John Randolph, Jerry Stiller, Sonny Dufo. Your announcer is Will Lyman. Blacklisted was produced, written, and directed by Tony Kahn. Co-producer for Blacklisted is Harriet Risen. Associate producers are Sonny Dufo, Spencer Weisbroth, and Eileen Silverstone. Chief engineer is Kevin McLaughlin. Original music was composed and performed by Bill Bookheim. Major funding for this program came from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities, and the Threshold Foundation, and with production help from KCRW Santa Monica and WBUR Boston. This podcast of Blacklisted is sponsored by Audible.com, where you can download over 40,000 audiobooks, magazines, radio shows, and more. To download a free audiobook today, go to Audible.com.